And uh, here we are. It's the Chennai Storytelling Festival 2021. And this uh, session, uh, an hour and a half, all about the Earth Stories Collection. So um, uh, please, uh, leaders of this session, please introduce yourselves and, uh, and give us the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And I am Donald from Scotland, and I am going to go uh, first. Uh, and we in Scotland are absolutely delighted to be part, to be a partner in the Earth Stories collection. And we'll hear more about that as we go on. But first, I just want to, uh, to greet you from a wintry and snowy Scotland, <laughs> where the darkness has also crept in and we're under a bit of feet of snow and, and it's very cold, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite fun in its own way. So I, I want to take you immediately back 50 years uh, to when I was uh, a young lad working on a Scottish hill farm. And we had many thousands of sheep up there in the mountains, but on the lower slopes of the, uh, the hills, we grew hay for winter feed. Now on the boundary of this farm, there was a golf course. And uh, the, the lower fields came alongside the, the golf course. And at one point, there was this strange squiggle in the boundaries. The golf course went that way. The uh, farm went that way. And in the middle was a strange no person's land. And that was a fairy now, an ancient burial mound that was believed to be inhabited by what people then and still called the fairies. And the farm, we did not touch that mound. The golf course did not touch that mound. There it rested. Now, in my later life, I have become more interested and connected with these places in our ancient landscape. And what I have found is that those places and those people do not like to be called fairies. They are the little people, the gentle kind, the Dunya Sea, the people of peace. They are the ancestors. And I would like to take you now west in our beautiful country to the oceans and to the islands. And there, there is an island in the Firth of Clyde called Butte. And at its southern end is a beautiful small bay, all sandy. And the sea washes in. And the fields come right down to the bay, and right in the center of the bay is an old skeleton of a ship, grounded, wrecked, many generations ago, and there it rests and rots. And at one end of the bay, there is a mound, an ancient burial mound, a now. Now, in this bay, in the little row of cottages on the edge of the sea, <laughs> lived an old sea captain. He was called, he was always known just as the Cap'n. He was a far-travelled mariner. I don't know whether he'd been to Canada and to India and to Asia, to all the places we have people here tonight. He was far traveled, but that was in his past. Now he was retired, he was settled there in his little cottage. And every day he went out walking on the shore to see what the tide had washed in that day. And he walked along in one fair morning and he came to the end of the bay and there he found workmen, laborers, 
from the local farm and they were busy tearing down and leveling the old mound. What are you doing, said the captain. Oh, said the labourers, looking a little shame-faced. The farmer wants us to take down this old mound, to extend his field right to the shore. The captain looked surprised, but he said, it's, it's, oh, we know, said the men, we know. It's the wee folk. It belongs to them. No good can come of this, this mean, grasping farmer. He wants to develop every inch, every bit of land for gain. No good can come of it. Well, the captain, there's nothing to do with him. He shrugged his shoulders. Back he walked along. Now that evening, he was sitting by his fireside in the cottage there in the shore. He was smoking his pipe. He was drinking his dram, his ushkabe, the water of life. Yeah, and he was just letting the, the day mull over when suddenly there came a knock at the cottage door. Quite insistent. Well, it was dark and the, the captain went to the door, he opened it. Actually, it wasn't that dark. It was a starlit night as we often have out here in the West. So you could see down to the beach, you could see out to the sea, you could see the stars sparkling in the sea. There was nobody there, nobody at the door. But after a minute, the captain looked down. And there, there was a little wee man, bearded, tanned, long hair. He looked a bit like Grian, but much smaller, much smaller. There at the door, Cap'n, Cap'n, said the wee man, we need your help. My help, said the captain. Yes, said the wee fellow. That mean skinflint of a farmer. He's leveled our home. We're homeless. All the dinya she, the people of peace, we are homeless. We need your help. We need to take to ship. We know nothing of this. Me, me, said the captain, just a minute. He said, I'm retired. I have no ship. Oh, that wouldn't matter, said the wee fella. We have a ship. We have a ship. And he's tugging at the cap and trousers. Get your jacket, get your jacket. Well, the cap and put on his jacket, his sea jacket, and down he went onto the beach. And what a sight greeted his eyes. Because that beach was all a hurry and a scurry of the wee folk rushing here to and fro, carrying pots and pans and bags and packages and oh, all oh, a huge hurry. We must take ship, said the wee fellow. And the most amazing thing was, you remember that old skeleton of a boat I told you about, rotting on the beach? Well, it was growing before the captain's very eyes. Up came these old timbers. It was growing back. The hull, the deck, even the masks are, were reaching up. The masts were reaching up towards the starlit sky. And the wee people, they were busy. They were tacking together lots of little cloths and making the most amazing patchwork sails you have ever seen. And slowly the ship began to move. All aboard, said the wee fella. All aboard, the captain is ready to sail. And they all tumbled and bumbled and hurried and scurried, piling into that boat as it gradually glided into the sea. The captain's ready to sail, said the wee fella. Well, out into the bay went the boat. 
in under that beautiful starlit sky. And the captain, he put his hand to the tiller and he felt the pulse of a living ship on the sea. But, but where are we going, said the captain. Never mind that, said the wee fella. We're going to E. We're going to E. The ship knows where to go. We just need your hand on the tiller, Captain. Well, the boat, as if of its own accord, with all that bustle of the little folk, headed straight out of the bay. And the boat swung west out round the island, and nor nor west, out into the open sea, with a beautiful headwind behind. It rode the waves with the grace of a swan so beautiful. And then, of course, the captain remembered. E, E, the old name for Iona, Iona, the beautiful sacred island of the West. That was where they were going. And as if the boat knew its own mind, but the captain steering up they sailed north, northwest in a calm sea with a gentle breeze behind until there ahead of them was the beautiful island of Iona green and rocky, even under a night sky. And as they came on towards the island, there was a bay opening in front of them, a sandy bay on the south of the island. And on each horn of the bay was a mound, an old mound. And on and on they came, and gently the boat came into the bay. It glided forward, it beached, and oh, suddenly, what a hustle and bustle as all the wee folk tumbled and bumbled and hurried and scurried as out they scrambled from the boat carrying their packages and their bundles and all their living goods on their backs and their heads and the foam washed into the shore. But... As they all struggled to land, suddenly the captain was amazed to see all this other horde of little people pouring along the beach and rushing down towards the shore and the foam and the wash as the waves broke and the sand to pull in their cousins, their friends, the other little folk strangers many, to pull them in to safety on the shore. And oh, there was an embracing and a hugging and there were tears and there were cheers and there was greeting and there was weeping. Oh, welcome, welcome, you're safe. Oh, they said, oh, it's terrible. Our house, our home has been destroyed by this wicked farmer, this mean old skin flint. We're homeless. Oh, come, come, said the little people of Io, of Iona. Don't be concerned, they said. Look, look, come and stay with us. We have two homes. And sure enough, they pointed to each horn of the bay. And on each horn was an ancient mound, a mound of the Dunya she of the little folk, of the gentle kind, of the wee people. And oh, they were all welcomed in and settled. There was room and a welcome and a grace and a peace for all. And suddenly the captain realized he had to get home. He had delivered his precious cargo. Now what about him? <gasps> Don't worry, said the little fella. That ship knows its way. Keep your hand to the tiller. And here, Cap'n, here is a gift for you. And he handed the Cap'n a little box. No, no, said the Cap'n. 
I want no pay. I want no reward for what I have done this night. Ah, said the little fella. No, no. He said, this is no reward. This is no pay. This is a minding, Cap'n. A minding of the little people, the Dunya she. Well, soon the Cap'n was on that boat. It backed out. It glided out of the bay. Down it went to the open sea, south by southeast, round into the island of Butte and into the bay. And almost without thinking, the boat came aground and it began to sink, to subside, to grow back into the beach in its old ruined state. Well, before he could think or remember, the captain was back in his little cottage and he slept sound that night. And many nights after he slept sound, but he was at rest and at peace. And that little box, the minding, it was full of the gold coins, the old coins that had sunk to the bottom of the sea. It was never exhausted. He had his pipe of tobacco. He had his dram. He was a happy man. But that farmer, that bit of ground that they stole from the little folk, that yielded nothing but thorns and thistles to the end of that miserable old farmer's day. And so, my friends, may the blessing of the Dunya She and the welcome of the Dunya She to the stranger be always yours and a blessing and a good health be with you. Thank you. So that's that's a story, friends, from the from the collection, and um, uh, uh, Brian will, will get, uh, Green will give you some context now, and you'll see how that 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 story fits into the 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 purposes and and the values of the collection connecting with the Earth Charter. But uh, it's this principle throughout that, that, that we, we seek the indigenous stories of the peoples and cultures of the world. So, Grian, thank you for being a host and friend to that story and to me. And uh, I hand over to Grian. Thank you very much, uh, Donald. Thank you, Eric, for inviting us. Uh, uh, Donald, you are wonderful. <laughs> you are... Uh, uh, I want to learn to tell stories like you. <laughs> okay, then uh, I I want to. Uh, okay, this this is the. Okay, then uh, thank you very much to everybody for uh, your attendance, and thank you also to Jennifer Ramsey and to Alit Willis and Donald uh, for giving voice to the stories of the Earth Stories Collection. Uh, but uh, what is the Earth Stories Collection? Uh, the Earth Stories Collection is a reservoir of, of myths, legends, fables, and folk tales uh, capable to transmit a systemic, uh, uh, ecocentric, and organicist worldview and the values and principles of the Earth Charter. This is uh, our definition of the Earth Stories Collection. The collection is inspired by the Global Seed Vault in the island of Svalbard in Norway, in the Arctic. This is a food crop seed bank in which uh, uh, seeds from all around the world are, are preserved uh, as a guarantee in the case of uh, a famine uh, due to a global crisis or disaster. In this sense, the Earth, uh, the Earth Stories Collection would be a cultural, cultural, 
seed bank, uh, something like a reservoir of educational resources for the construction or reconstruction, uh, reconstruction if our civilization collapses. Uh, for a, a global society um, based on social and economic uh, justice, on peace, democracy, and respectful for the earth and the rest of the species. That is the values of the Earth Charter. What is the Earth Charter? This is the framework that we have uh, selected for uh, making the Earth Stories collection. Why? Because the Earth Charter is the only truly global document produced by the international community. It, it is different uh, to the uh, human rights uh, declaration because the human rights uh, were made by Westerners, but the Earth Charter was made uh, but, uh, with the suggestions and contributions of ten, tens of thousands of people from any kind of cultures in the world uh, uh, who, agree, who agreed on a common set of values. In this sense, the Earth Charter uh, would be the best ethical reference for a global human society in the 21st century. Uh, this is an initiative of the Avalon Project. The Avalon Project is an Spanish educational and activist NGO. Uh, we are uh, just uh, transmitting, we are uh, working with the framework of the Earth Charter in all our activities and we are uh, managing also the Earth Stories Collection. Uh, the origin of the uh, collection, the foundation of the collection is uh, a research that I made uh, in the university, at the University of Granada in Spain. But we have, uh, I, I had a wonderful collaboration, a wonderful uh, contribution through uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jane Brown from the University of Edinburgh. She was my uh, uh, methodological uh, supervisor. Uh, in my research, I uh, justified the need for a change in the worldview of our civilization, uh, mainly in the West. Uh, the idea is to, to shift from an uh, anthropocentric, uh, materialistic, ex excessively uh, rationalist and mechani uh, mechanistic uh, worldview to a ecocentric, uh, systemic, organicist, an integrative worldview. This uh, means also a shift from the Newtonian Cartesian uh, scientific paradigm to a, a complex systems uh, paradigm, a scientific paradigm that is from uh, one century ago, the new scientific paradigm. But in this research, uh, I looked for also for educational resources to transmit this worldview. And I thought that the, the best way to transmit a worldview are stories. Myths, legends, fables, and uh, folk tales are the way in which uh, all cultures, all civilizations, all societies are transmitting their uh, worldviews. Then in line with Joseph Campbell, we thought these are the building blocks of all culture and civilization, and then through the stories, we can make a new civilization, a sustainable civilization. Uh, in, in this way, I, I read uh, over uh, 2,000 stories from around the world, and I made a first selection of 336 stories uh, capable to transmit this complex system thinking and the values of the Earth's charter. Uh, on this foundational research, the Earth Stories Collection has been built. But uh, what does it mean, really? We think, honestly, we think that the Earth Stories Collection can have a deep cultural value. Uh, more in these in this times, times in which we need a multicultural civilization, we need a, a, a powerful and deep, uh, and deep respect for other cultures then the Earth Stories Collection can be a way to uh, understanding, a way to understanding between uh, cultures, 
uh, a way to foster intercultural dialogue, tolerance, and cooperation. Uh, for us, it is candidate candidate to be declared intangible cultural heritage of humanity by UNESCO. Indeed, uh, uh, Professor Federico Mayor Zaragoza, who was Director General of UNESCO between 1987 and 1999, is the uh, honorary president of the Earth Stories Collection. He was who created the category of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And the first uh, of this, uh, um, this in this category was uh, exactly, precisely, it was the storytellers of the Jemal Ethna in, in Marrakesh. The storytellers of Jemal Ethna were the first intangible cultural heritage in all the world. Then we think that the Earth Stories Collection can be um, an ideal candidate for this. Uh, the entities involved with, uh, before uh, Donald has been talking that uh, um, the Scottish International Storytelling Festival is one of the partners in this endeavor. Okay, we are three uh, partners in this, uh, in this project. The first is the International Secretariat of the Earth Charter, which is uh, at the uh, United Nations University for Peace in Costa Rica. Uh, the second is the Scottish International Storytelling Festival, one of the most important world festivals in its field. And the third one is, as I said uh, before, the Avalon Project. This is an educational and activist NGO, as I said before. And we are who are uh, uh, the people who are managing the Earth Stories Collection. Um, but we go to the collection itself. All the stories in the collection uh, have been selected. All of them are selected uh, according to the uh, worldview components. That is, all the stories uh, are capable to transmit this complex systems thinking, this ecocentric worldview and the values of the Earth Charter, all of them. So, uh, so in this moment, we have 75 stories in the collection. We are in this moment uh, in, in our second year. Uh, we started in October, uh, 2019. Uh, we have 75 stories in this moment belonging to 56 nations, 35 cultures, and 18 spiritual or philosophical traditions. 66 of these 75 stories uh, are under a Creative Commons license, uh, non-commercial uh, Creative Commons license. Seven of them are under public domain. Uh, one of them is anti-copyright. And the other one is a, is a story with copyright, but we got the permission from the daughter of the author. It's an Oneida story uh, written by Paula Underwood and uh, her daughter gave us permission to include this story. It's a wonderful story in our collection. Uh, the most of the stories are own adaptations, are new adaptations. Uh, and but we have a rule in 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 this uh, in this issue because we are not making adaptations from First Nations uh, of Americas, we are not making adaptations uh, from Sub-Saharan African uh, cultures and uh, Australian Aboriginal cultures. This is because uh, we are uh, European people, and we thought that. Uh, we have made, our nations have made a lot of uh, damage and oppression on these cultures. And then we, th we thought that uh, we, we, we cannot make adaptations from these cultures. We ask for permission to their representatives or their uh, uh, keepers of traditions. And we ask for their own adaptations uh, to be included in the Earth Stories collection. And okay, the collection is in this moment, the collection is in English, is in Spanish, and soon, very soon, will be in Portuguese uh, from a team of, from uh, Brazil, who is uh, working on, on the stories. 
Uh, and we are working also uh, in translating uh, the stories into French and German, but we need some help in, in, in this regard. Uh, uh, about the access to the stories, you can access all the stories. All the stories are in open access in our website. Um, our website uh, is in our website is uh, in this link is the Earth Stories Collection .org. The Earth Stories Collection .org. You can download all the stories there. Download for free in PDF. Uh, you can have all the stories and but we have also a, a paper format of the stories because we don't know if our civilization will collapse and maybe in the future we have no electricity then we need also the collection in paper so we have uh, at the moment every year we are uh, publishing a new book in this moment, we have two volumes, volume zero and volume one. And uh, in next October, we will publish the volume two. Uh, you can find this uh, in, in Amazon. Uh, we need to change because uh, for us, it's not good to have the books in Amazon, but we have no option in this moment. Uh, we will look for, uh, look for other options. And, uh, uh, we need to speak about the Earth Storytellers, but uh, this is, this is a, a project uh, which is very is, uh, closely uh, closely related to the Earth Stories Collection. But this was an idea and uh, initiative uh, that uh, proposed uh, Donald Smith, and I think that Donald Smith is the best to explain what is this idea, uh, the Earth Storytellers. Please, Donald. The floor, the floor is yours. Uh, a moment uh, to. So uh, just very, very briefly, friends, because I think this is of interest to, I'm sure, to many of you on this uh, call. Um, the we want these stories to be told, and for more stories like them to be told. And therefore, we, we need uh, what is, uh, I think, already there in the making, an international network of storytellers and educational activists and ecologists who are committed to their charter principles and uh, are interested in sharing and telling these stories in their own social and educational and cultural contexts and enlisting the interests of others so you can you'll see it all on the website you can put in to join that network just explaining uh, your sort of background and, and values and how you would like to take forward and expand the work of our stories collection so it's very much an open invitation, and I'm uh, delighted that tonight we're going to be hearing from Jennifer Ramsey, who is, is a member of the network, and also from Alette Willis, who was an advisor uh, in the whole development of the project and is herself a, a distinguished researcher, but also a fine storyteller and a member of the network. So it's, it's really all on the website. Yeah, that's me, Green. Thank you, Donald. Uh, please, Jennifer, uh, can you uh, tell uh, another story of the Earth Stories Collection, please? Do Sorry, do we want to leave people time to ask questions now about what you just said, Green, before we we jump right into another story. Okay, if you want, uh, people have some question. Thank you, Alet. <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if someone uh, has uh, uh, some question to about the, the Earth Stories collection or even about the, the story told by uh, Donald, It seems it's okay. 
Okay. Then maybe okay. we can go with Jennifer. Thank you, Alette. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to share with you a story that is found in Estonia and in Finland. It's called How the Trees Stop Talking. They say that a long, long time ago, when the earth was young and trees still talked to humans, a man had to go out and get some firewood. So he picked up his axe and off he went. And he could see like a tall, straight birch tree. Perfect for the fire, he said. He took his axe and just about to cut it down when the tree said, no, no, please don't cut me down. I'm a birch tree. You can use my bark to make um, baskets. You can use my twigs to make brooms. And if you look after the trees, the trees will look after you. Well, thought the man, this is a very important tree. Okay, I'll leave you be and I'll go and get another tree. He walked on a little bit further and there was a cherry tree. This one really is perfect for the fire. He picked up his axe and just about to cut it when the tree said, no, 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 please don't cut me. Listen, I give you cherries. You can make cherry jam and cherry pies. And I give the most beautiful flowers after a cold, dark winter. Well, thought the man, you're right. And I do love cherries. And then the tree said, if you look after the trees, the trees will look after you. Okay, okay, no problem. You can, you can keep, you can be alive. So he picked up his axe and off he went. And soon after he saw a pine tree. Now this really is the perfect tree to cut down because it doesn't give flowers, it doesn't give fruit. I mean, what can you do with a pine tree? So he took his axe and he was just about to cut it down when the tree said, no, no, don't cut me. If you want fuel for the fire, why not use my pine cones? And there's lots of little animals live off my pine nuts. If you look after the trees, the trees will look after you. Oh, okay. The man was getting a little bit frustrated. He picked up his axe and he went looking for a tree to cut down. But it seemed that all the trees had some sort of reason to stay alive. The oak tree said that it was home to lots, to, to hundreds, maybe thousands of little animals, and it gave shade in the summer. Well, after a while, he just didn't know what to do. So he just stopped, closed his eyes, connected with the earth, and the answer came to him. It was actually a bit obvious. Just go into the forest and pick up the fallen branches. And as soon as he had that thought, this little man appeared, a little like Donald's man in his story. But mine was even smaller. And he had clothes like made of birch bark. He had a little hat like made of an acorn. And he said, oh, thank you so much for looking after the trees. I'd like to give you a little present. And he gave him a wand, a little lovely wand. And he said, listen, with this wand, you can ask for what you need from nature, but never, never, never ask for anything that goes against nature. The man said, thank you. He took the wand and the little man disappeared. So he picked up some branches and he went home and he told his family. And they said, well, we're hungry, let's try it out. Um, birds, bring us some cherries, ding. And all of a sudden the birds came with cherries, mmm, delicious cherries. Let's try again. Bees, bring us some honey, 
And from nowhere, all these little bees arrived with the most delicious honey. Wow. Well, they say that that family lived well. And they did ask for many things, but always with permission. For example, if they wanted to tend their fields, they would say, moles, please, could you help move the earth? Ding! And the moles would come out and they would start tending the earth. Ants, please, could you um, help us plant the seeds? Ding! And all of a sudden, all these little ants would come from nowhere and plant all the seeds and a perfect furrow. It's was, it was just perfect. Well, time went by. They seemed happy. They seemed prosperous for, for those times. And the man was coming to the end of his life. And as he lay there on his deathbed, he called his family to him. And he said, you're my eldest son, so this wand is for you. And please, family, always remember, if we look after the trees, the trees will look after us. And with that, he passed into the other world. Now, his family also respected nature. And they did, with the wand, ask for help. And that eldest son, at one point, also got to the end of his life. And the same thing happened. He called the family round his deathbed. He also gave his wand to his eldest son. And he said, please remember the words of my father. If we look after the trees, the trees will look after us, and he died. But that eldest son, he had different ideas. He thought all that traditional rubbish, I don't believe in it. Why should I look after the trees? And why do we always have such a small house? We could have a much bigger house. And why do we only have a couple of fields? We could have lots and lots of land. We could be rich. Huh. And one day, there he was out in the field, and it was freezing cold. The snow was thick in the ground. And he said, I don't have to put up with this cold. I have a magic wand. So he pointed it to the sun and said, well, the sun behind the clouds, he pointed it to the sky and he said, son, come out from behind those dark clouds. I want to feel the summer sun on my skin. Uh-oh, what had he asked for? Something that goes against nature. Well, they say that the summer sun did indeed come out from behind those dark clouds and it beamed down on that man, hot, really, really hot. They say that that man started to melt until he completely disappeared. And so did the magic wand. And from that moment onwards, they say that the trees stopped talking to human beings. But they also say that if we are in a forest and there's a little breeze, if you listen carefully, perhaps you can hear the trees whisper, if we look after the trees, the trees will look after us. And now, I would just ask you, still in this world of stories, if you feel like it, just to close your eyes for one moment and put your feet on the ground. And just imagine that little roots go out of your feet into the ground. And these little roots connect with the roots of all the people 
here in this meeting, all these people from all around the world. And they also connect with the trees, the trees from wherever we are. And just breathe into those roots. Can you hear the trees whisper? And perhaps let the energy from the earth go up through your roots to your feet, all the way up through your body, past your heart, all the way up through your head to the crown chakra and all the way up to space. And there is a new moon. We are all around the world, but we are all under that same new moon. And the new moon is the perfect time for wishing. Is there anything you'd like to wish for, for the trees? Perhaps to change the ending of this story so that they'll come back and talk to us? Just see if there's anything you can possibly wish for. This new moon is in Aquarius. And Aquarius is all about community. It's all about creating a new earth. Is there anything you'd like to wish for, for the community, for this new earth that's being created? And let's very slowly just bring down this energy from the new moon all the way down to earth, passing by our crown chakra, into our bodies, passing by our heart, and all the way down to the ground to connect again with this global community that we've created, virtual community and to the trees. And perhaps you'd like to spend a few seconds just communicating with the roots of the trees, what you'd like to wish for to change the end of this story. And then those trees can communicate with all the other trees all around the world. And when you feel it's time to come back, perhaps say a farewell to the, the roots underground, and we're going to come back to the here and the now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, if someone uh, wants to uh, uh, make a question or comment, anything, Green, you, do you maybe want to say a little bit about more about your answer to Laura Sims in the chat there? Because Laura asked, does the collection focus on stories that overtly teach a lesson? I look forward to looking through the marvelous collection. Do you want to say a little bit more about that, maybe?
I have uh, I have read before someone uh, who was uh, asked about uh, I don't know now where is the question but uh, if uh, each uh, story is uh, teaching uh, a lesson is is that what uh, have you said uh, Alet? Yes, uh, every story in the Earth Stories collection is connected with one or several. Uh, principles or uh, uh, fragments, excerpts of the Earth Charter. Then uh, every story uh, has a deep uh, insight, a deep uh, lesson to, to teach uh, based on the ethical principles of the Earth Charter. Carol, um. I wondered for uh, Jennifer asked about um, a st uh, ending to the story. If you could put an ending about forest bathing, in that when we have a question, that we go into the woods and listen to the trees and sit under a tree, hug a tree, and and get connected with that network that is very ancient. And I wanted there to be a little bird that flew out of, off the branch of one of the trees and uh, you know, just did a beautiful uh, flight dance that caused this um, grandson or great grandson to wake up. And that's what we all need. We need to wake up. So I, j just a wee comment there. I, I think it's very important that all the stories in the collection really work as stories. And uh, they, they have these in the, I, I mean, I watch this research process that Green, uh, with the support of others, went into about the depth of these stories and the values embodied in them. And there are, of course, a lot more stories to be added. But I think it is important that they, they also do work uh, just as stories and that people who tell them can uh, develop and add and create and because that's what good stories do they're like trees they grow they have deep roots but they also have branches and leaves so i think that's all part and that's where the earth storytellers sort of network comes in because the stories are brought to life the we've got these wonderful ways of sourcing them and the website and the publications but at the end of the day, stories live by, by being told in, in live and, and living contexts, whether it's classrooms or festivals or forests or whatever. So I think this is the double beauty of these. These are deeply rooted stories, but, but they are also living, flourishing stories. And um, it's lovely to hear people responding so nicely to them. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. I think uh, we have uh, now uh, uh, our, our friend, Alette Willis, uh, who is uh, the, the consul, uh, consultant editor, I think. I, I don't remember now in English, sorry. <laughs> she was who uh, reviewed uh, all, all the first book of the Earth Stories collection. She, she made a, a complete uh, revision of the book and uh, we are uh, very grateful to, to her for this uh, work. And please, Alette, tell your story. Thank you, Grian, and thank you, Jennifer, for the beautiful story, and Donald for the story of the reef folk at the beginning. It's a real pleasure to be here amongst great storytellers from around the world. And the story that I want to share with you is a story from the Celtic parts of the world and in the Celtic parts of the world where I'm living in one of them here in Scotland. It's the season of Imbolc, um, the season of the great Celtic goddess Bridie and the season of the return of the light, the beginning of spring, the poking through of the little snowdrops 
through the snow that we have here, as Donald was mentioning at the beginning of this session. Um, and Bridie, the goddess, she's the goddess of poetry, of storytelling, of healing, of midwifery, lambs, all great things and all great things for this particular conference and this particular, um, yeah, this particular project. Um, and the goddess Bridie is often kind of merged with the real person, the Saint Bridget in Ireland. And the story I'm going to share with you um, tonight or this morning, wherever you are, um, is a story about Saint Bridget. So when Saint Bridget was still quite a young woman, she built herself a small wooden shack underneath a spreading oak tree in a place that came to be known as Kildare after that tree in Ireland. When Bridget moved into that wee shack, it was still quite a rural place, Kildare, and the shack and the tree were surrounded by a dandelion meadow, and beyond that was forest for, for quite a long ways. And that was why Bridget loved to live there. She loved the wild things. She loved the quiet. But word of her healing gifts and her wisdom spread quickly. And it wasn't long before many people started coming on pilgrimages to seek her healing, to seek her wisdom, to seek her company. And many of those people came to love Kildare just as much as Bridget did. And so soon, where there'd been just a meadow and a forest, a village grew up. Even the king came to consult Bridget on occasion and he too fell in love with the spot. So he built a hunting, a hunting, um, what do you call it? Sorry, it's late here, a hunting lodge. The king, it would have been the lodge um, in those woods. Now at this time in Ireland, there were still a lot of wolves that roamed the woods and they roamed the woods around Kildare. Bridget loved the wolves just as she loved all living things, but the villagers were a little bit afraid of the wolves. And sometimes when a lamb went missing, they blamed the wolves. And sometimes they were right to do so. A lamb is a tasty meal for a pack of wolves, especially with the king taking so many of the deer out of the woodlands. And sometimes over time, as the deer dwindled, the king blamed the wolves for the dwindling numbers of deer. And he was partially right. The wolves had been hunting the deer in that part of Ireland for hundreds and hundreds of years. They didn't know that the deer suddenly now belonged to the king. But still the king wanted to punish them for poaching his deer from his forests. And so he made a decree that he would give anyone who brought him the carcass of a dead wolf, he would give a gold coin. Now, despite putting a price on the heads of the wild wolves, the king himself kept a tame wolf, a wolf he'd been given as a cub. And he'd gone to great pains to train this wolf up so that it walked to his heel. And he was very proud to walk into court with this massive wild beast walking tamely to his heel. And the king often brought this wolf with him to Kildare when he came to the hunting lodge. One day, the wolf got loose from the lodge and being an amiable beast, loving the company of people whom he was quite used to, the wolf of course wandered towards the village. Now the woodcutter was out on the edge of the village, chopping wood, when he saw this wolf, this lone wolf, coming closer and closer to the village and he heard children playing 
and he worried for the safety of those children and he had no way of knowing that this was a tame wolf. So the woodcutter took an arrow, notched it in his bow and shot that poor wolf between the shoulder blades and the wolf died. Expecting his reward of a gold coin, the woodcutter happily put that wolf over his shoulders and walked through the woods to the king's hunting lodge. Now the king recognized immediately from the markings of that wolf that it was his tame wolf, his beloved pet. And the king's grief turned very quickly to anger. And he had the poor hapless woodcutter thrown into the dungeon and he sent one of his men off to the village to get the carpenter to build a gallows because he was going to hang that woodcutter for killing his beloved pet wolf. And that was when the villagers found out what had happened to their friend and their neighbor. And of course, they went to Bridget and asked for her help. Bridget borrowed a horse and a cart and set out of the village. And as she turned into the dark track that went through the dark forest towards the king's lodge, out of the corner of her eye, she saw a white shadow tracking the cart through the woods. And the horse saw that white shadow too and started to get a little skittish to wicker, to shy away until Bridget quieted the horse with a few words. And that white shadow leapt out of the woods and landed next to Bridget on the bench of the cart. And it was a huge white wolf with beautiful dark brown eyes and a long pink tongue that it used to lick Bridget's face. And they made a strange pair, those two, this towering white wolf and this fairly small, blonde-haired, blue-eyed young woman as the cart pulled into the courtyard of the hunting lodge. And the two were shown into the hall of the lodge to the king. And the king, well, the king looked greedily at that beautiful white wolf white wolves were as rare back then as they are now. And he couldn't help thinking what he would look like walking into court with a large white wolf walking to his heel. Bridget proposed to the king that if he let the woodcutter live, let the woodcutter go, she said, this wolf, this wolf has offered to take the place of your beloved lost wolf. Well, it didn't take the king long to make his decision. He would lose nothing by letting the woodcutter go and he would gain this beautiful white wolf. And so he agreed and Bridget knelt down and whispered to that wolf that if he served the king well, he was sure to get the best cut of meat from the king's table at every meal. And the wolf loped happily over to the king and the king pet silky white fur of that wolf's ear. And a, a sense of wonder went over his face. And Bridget, well, she left with the woodcutter back on that horse cart through the woods towards the village. And as they went, she leaned over to the woodcutter and she said, it is always better that two wicked beasts perhaps go free, that one innocent may be saved. And that is the story of St. Bridget and the wolf. And so if you see pictures of this little Saint Bridget and a big wolf, 
you see that sometimes in some Celtic decoration, you will know what that story is. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alette. Thank you very much. I am very happy to have a, a friends like you, like Jennifer and Donald. Thank you very much. Uh, without you, uh, this Pleasure. would be the same thing. <laughs> Please, uh, Donald, can you make the role of uh, uh, host? Because my English is not good, you know, and maybe I am losing uh, comments. I, am, I can, I can <laughs> lose uh, uh, remarks. Uh, uh, green, green. Your your being lost is always inviting because other people can come in, you see, and whatever. So, I mean, friends, this is just really open to thought and comment. And I I just like to set the discussion going a little bit because my great passion and interest in all this is about how these stories are are reincarnated, if you like, and reused. So just to take that last story, um, I, I'm working at a community project at the moment in a very post-industrial area, um, just west of Edinburgh, West Lothian. And um, there are huge old shale and coal mining uh, bings, as we call them here, mounds, five great mounds called the five, they call them the five sisters locally. And they have a community wildlife park there that the community has developed. It's, it's relatively unfunded, but it's, it's incredibly driven by a passion for conservation. And one of their glories is having two Alaskan wolves um, that have been um, bred in captivity and have a wonderful um, kind of um, uh, sort of environment there. And uh, people in the local community have given to, to look after these wolves. And so I hear a story like that that Alette has just told. And uh, the challenge I, I would put out to people that I, I would like to respond to, the, these are not stories that belong in some isolated world of magic or mysticism or fancy. They draw on imagination and fancy, but these are stories that have a huge connection with the real world of animals and trees and plants that we are struggling to nurture and sustain. And I, I feel that storytellers have so much to give this uh, struggle. And, um, but to do that, we have to take our stories out in, amidst real places and, and real people. So it would just be lovely to uh, have people's thoughts about that and comments or criticisms or discussion points or, or whatever they would like. I'm just very conscious that there will be a huge reservoir, a seed bank of knowledge and experience in a, a, a gathering like this. So please, it's, it's completely open to thought and comment. Please, Carol. Wolves are a big thing in Minnesota where I live. They used to be an endangered species. And then a lone wolf came from the Northern forest down to the Minneapolis St. Paul area and mated with another lone wolf. And they had a whole pack of wolves. And then they began you know, killing pets and uh, livestock and things. And now they've been taken off the endangered species list and they're actually giving money to people who, who kill wolves. And, and it's so interesting because um, my parents retired up to the Canadian border and my dad was in the woods all the time. He, he retired young and he said, very few people would see a wolf because they are normally don't go around people, you know, but, but we have to learn to coexist kind of. Um, and now because the, the wolves are no longer uh, in endangered species, we have a whole population of deer right in the, the city and the suburbs. And the, the deer, they don't have predators. And so there's, there's so many deer and it's um, the balance of nature. 
it is so interesting, isn't it? We we have no no wild wolves here in Scotland, except in one very limited estate in the north, and we have far too many deer because they're you know they 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 eat the trees, they they kill the mm -hmm. trees. So that's yeah. very, that's very interesting. So others, please come in. Just, I have one more thing about the wolf. Sorry, you sorry, Carol. I, I, I visited a, a, a spiritual community called Sparrowhawk Village in Oklahoma. And the people there, it was an intentional mystical Christian community. And they were upset because the deer, it's on a mountain, used to be Cherokee land. The deer were eating their um, uh, shrubbery, their landscaping. And some of the people in the village were very dedicated veg vegetarians. And others said, well, we have to kill those deer because they're killing all our plants and we don't want to put up these great big fences in our gardens. And, you know, there, there was a big brouhaha. So they went to the founder of the community to ask her, Carol Parrish, what they should do. And she put it back at them and she said, when you're hungry enough, you'll kill the deer. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Barry, you're, you, you, you're up to come in and then uh, Healing Fairy Tales. Oh. Actually, Donald, I think Healing Fairy Tales had their uh, hand. Come in first. Okay, please, first. please. Thank you for <laughs> thanks, that. On, on thanks, your Barry. Hi. Yeah, it's late for me, so I'll remain in the dark for the minute. Um, I just want to say how important your stories are for in the environmental dialogue. Um, for so long, people um, have been talking about how we need to engage with the earth, but I feel like story has so, is so powerful in connecting us to our imaginations, to our hearts, to that uh, magical place within. So I'm really grateful for what you guys are doing because I've spent the last 25 years of my life working, my background's environmental science, working with businesses. And there is so, there, you know, just telling people facts really has not resonated deeply with them. So I feel like these stories, and I love the Earth Charter, the fact that they're mapped to that is just so important. And there's just so many places to take that I can think about where to take your stories. And so I'm you know, excited to contact you. And I'm wondering what has, been, what has been the reception of some of the stories? Like how are you seeing people change their minds around their connection to, to the planet? So I think in fairness, it's quite easy. It's quite early to um, sort of pronounce on that. I, I think the most important thing we felt about it all, and I, I hope and Green or Alette would come in on this, is by working through the international network and discipline of the Earth Charter, we felt that you know, we weren't chucking out something that we were looking for a kind of instant response or um, gain or tick against, but that we were contributing something to what was already a really wide and disciplined movement. It's 20 years, the Earth Charter's 20 years in December, it's out of his 20th anniversary. And I think we were hugely encouraged by just that response we had, kind of along what you're saying, Alice, really there, that this was a distinctive contribution to a wider effort. And um, I, I think we would be quite humble, modest, about we're contributing to a wider struggle. And there'll be many other insights and resources to be, to be added to it. But I'll, um, I think others might have something to add to that, but I'll let Barry get in his question. Thank you for that, Alice, and for your comment in the chat. Barry, I'll take you, and then I think Alette's going to come in with, with yes, that. Thank you. Thank you for the stories, and hello, everyone. I'm Barry. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, Jennifer, the story that you told reminded me of something, and I think I heard it on the radio, although it could have been something I dreamed. But wasn't there something recently that scientists are finding that trees communicate with each other under the earth? And, and I yes. don't know if that was I had to step away, but if, if anyone knows more about that, I just love the way that, that our folklore often tells us things that the ancients knew that was true about the earth or about the comets or about rainbows, yeah. There it is. <laughs> the life of trees, yeah. I know it as well. I, I love what you're saying, Barry, because I actually studied uh, biology. And uh, a long time ago when I used to live in Edinburgh, 
And um, and people say, but why are you like a storyteller and an art therapist? What's it got to do with, with biology? And I feel it's just all part of the same thing. And I really do believe that the trees communicate underground. But now my son is studying biology and we have all these discussions, you know, because he's, no, no, but it's not science. And I'm saying, yeah, but you've got to look beyond that. You know, I mean, you know, science hasn't discovered certain things. So I, I totally agree with it. The fact that it's got the book, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's the, for me, it's the future. And I really do believe in this, this new world, like, you know, the structures have gone down and, you know, what the new Aquarius energy is all, you know, it's quite futuristic. It's so sort of new age, but what can we bring from the past? And I think definitely stories, all this of ancestral stories and, you know, that's what we can bring and, and talk to the trees. <laughs> totally. So there, there's, there's a fantastic American novel. Is it Richard Powers about the same, the same issue about the trees? Ab absolutely stunning. Uh, which creatively picks up the ideas about the, the book. So Alette, you were trying to get in. And I see Laura. Yeah, just to, to respond actually now to, to a couple of things to, to Alison. Um, and yes, I think in terms of the Earth Stories collection will be quite humble and it's at the beginnings. But we do know that um, when people are making decisions, when they're making ethical decisions, whether those are large scale decisions or kind of everyday decisions or decisions about what, what I'm going to do with my life, etc., that they're accessing the narrative parts of the brain. Our ethical decision-making is very much driven by story and by the parts of our brain that are structured around listening to stories and telling stories. So there's great scope for storytelling to make a big difference in terms of the decisions that people make, whether that's a small one about what to buy at the shops or a big one about what to do with their lives and how to devote themselves to bringing about the changes that we need in this world. We, you know, we are, we are working with the right parts of the brain. <laughs> and so I just wanted to say that. Um, and now even, even at this time of night, especially <laughs> at this time of night. Yes. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, there is a growing movement. I work in higher education. There is a growing movement, even in higher education, to pay more attention to traditional knowledge and traditional environmental knowledge and to um, understand that that needs to be part of environmental curricula, biological curricula, et cetera, alongside the Western forms of science and knowledge that have come out of Europe and European settlers. So you know, there's, there's good reasons to be hopeful. Um, and indeed, there's more and more recognition um, of these multiple sources of knowledge and that people who've lived in place with a particular ecosystem know a hell of a lot about that place and that particular ecosystem and that that knowledge is just as crucial as anything that's coming out of kind of the white coats, if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Alette. And thank you, Faye, for uh, posting the name of that fantastic novel, The Overstory. Laura? You got a turn? Yes. No, I love this um, project and can't wait to know more and more about it. Thank you all. But the, for me, the underlying knowledge that people had, which was deeply um, a knowledge, meaning that it was known, felt, was the interdependence of everything, which we're all talking about. And um, so sometimes we forget that it is engaging people in listening to the stories that actually uncovers in us a, a natural um, access to that place where we become everything in the story, where we can begin to remember this way of knowing. So um, I think it's, you know, for us as storytellers, not to forget that, that, you know, we can put out these ideas and they're great, but we also have to remember that we have to, like what Alison was talking about, 
what moves people in business sometimes to hear a story is that they become emotionally engaged, that that place that they may have ignored begins to wake up and they can have a conversation that isn't political, but is deeply felt about the very issues that come up in the story. And that's, I think that's possibly where the deepest change begins to take place. Thank you, Laura, thank you. So now, Eric, I, I think you you yes. were you were going to get in a comment, and then yes. uh, Mary's going to going to contribute. Yes, uh, as a teenager, for years I had a, a strong fantasy of um, uh, uh, being taken away by wolves into the forest, and being raised by wolves. And I researched it, uh, and there are a number of documented cases in India. Uh, maybe that's why I've moved to India. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, uh, Rudyard Kipling wrote The Jungle Book in 1894, in which the main character, a human boy, is, is taken by, by, by wolves. So it's, uh, it's definitely an archetypal, long-standing um, dream to, be, uh, to live amongst the wolves. Thank you. Thank you. No transformations yet, though, before the end of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, Mary, you, you come in, please. Hi. Hello there from the center of North America in Manitoba. Um, yeah, I think I'm so excited about this project. I'm so glad. I thank you, Eric, for doing this. Um, I guess all I wanted to say is I find that the stories... I'm really excited about some of these stories. I've been telling uh, stories like this for a long time, but my finding is uh, anybody who listens to a story immediately builds an empathy for whatever character, the, the trees, and because it's not a logical reaction and that, that ability to be empathetic towards the, the characters in the story is its strength and then they can learn to love whatever it is in the story, the fairies, the, the, the trees, the water. So I found that just telling a story is probably the most important thing we can do whenever we have a chance. And I guess the only other thing I wanna say is the story I'm telling tomorrow is a story about a man who's saved by a wolf. Ah, excellent. Oh. There's something to look forward to. I, I can see lots of lots of affirmative <laughs> gestures coming through. Now, Faye is trying to get in. I'm very impressed because Faye has a flesh-colored hand instead of a yellow hand. I, I don't know how she's achieved that, but, uh, you know, she's uh, she may appear as a cat now. I, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> Faye, Faye, please, on you go. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how I did that either. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to express, I th I'm just really happy to hear uh, the respect you're, you're giving the um, Indigenous people of North America and Sub-Saharan Africa and Australia uh, by not using their stories. I was a park naturalist in the, in the 80s. And of course, then we told lots of um, the local Indigenous tales, and I sometimes got permission from you know, an anthropologist, but I didn't, wasn't connected to those Indigenous people, but then I discovered that it wasn't appropriate at all, so I'm glad that has spread far and wide now. Um, and just the other thought, I, are you, um, I mean, one of the thoughts I've had around important stories to tell are stories of personal moments of transformation in nature, that if we if we share personal stories also about how you know nature has made a significant like healing on ourselves or or other you know kind of blissful moments that this is a good good thing to to share and spread and encourage um, but is your collection strictly folk tales or or are you also including personal stories at all so I think at the moment, the emphasis is on traditional and indigenous stories. But I think the point of having the Earth Stories Network is that that then spills over quite naturally into people's personal experiences and reactions. 
but but the core of the the collection is is definitely around the discipline of traditional indigenous uh, stories but then i think that the inspiration of that naturally ripples out through the the freedom and creativity of the storytellers so listen folks we're we're quite sort of on a glide uh, towards the end of this so i want to come back to green and so, Green, these are your, I'm not going to say they're your last words, because I feel you'll have many more words, but I, I, in terms of this session, it would just be nice to have whatever comment you would like to make, but also just a little wrap-up or response to, to what you've heard tonight. Uh, I, I would like to share uh, something that uh, <clears throat> it is in, in the research that I made about the indigenous uh, stories because in my research, I compared the stories belonging to uh, written cultures uh, with stories belonging to oral cultures. And uh, the, the findings with uh, significant results with statistical uh, analysis, with uh, uh, quantitative analysis was that the stories uh, belonging to oral cultures were significant, very significant, uh, they have uh, more uh, complex systems components and they uh, transmit better the values of the Earth Charter than the stories belonging to written cultures. And comparing uh, the oral cultures, the stories uh, that uh, had more complex systems uh, thinking were the stories from uh, First Nations in the Americas. Above all, we need the stories of the oral cultures. We need, above all, the stories of the First Nations in the Americas. Above all, because they have the best stories to create this worldview that we need to overcome the civilizational collapse. For me, it's enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For that, that's, a, that's a lovely response. I agree. And to the fact we, we have a lot of people from North America on, uh, on, on the group tonight. So, uh, friends, I, 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 I've just really enjoyed this conversation tonight. I, um, I watched at close quarters the years of disciplined and determined effort that Grian put into developing this project, supported by his companion in life, Marta. And uh, it wasn't easy going at a lot of points. He, he really stuck with this through thick and thin. And I, I think now, you know, it's, it's really spreading and it's been really lovely to see all of you tonight and to have your uh, thoughts and comments and uh, the fact that you're able to bring your own experience and knowledge and um, initiative to all of this because it is truly a, a global effort. So I, I, I think I, I hand back now to Eric to uh, finally wrap up as host of the session. So uh, thank you, Alette. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to everybody who's contributed uh, tonight.